All right, cool. All right, guys, well, we can get started. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming out and joining us for this q and I know second years are super busy with clinical and first and third years, you guys are grinding out with spring semester. So really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to come. And thank you so much for sending in your questions. I mean, just compiling them, they're really awesome questions. And I think that they'll really spark great conversation tonight. Uh, thank you, Dr. James and Dr. Sanfilippo for kind of getting the logistics done with making this happen and letting it happen. And of course, Thank you, Wesley, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to do this q and I know everyone is super, super pumped to just hear from you and learn from you. Um, again, everyone's questions were great. I actually compiled the questions into three categories based on kind of like the common theme that I saw with the questions. So the first category we'll go through is sports PT. The second category we'll go through is cash-based PT. And then the third one is social media and marketing as a PT. And as we go through the questions, I'll run through the pre-asked questions first. And then at the end of each category, we'll leave some time for additional questions, just in case you happen to think of a question that didn't happen to get answered with the pre-asked questions. Um, before we get started, I wanna give a little background on Wesley. I could talk so much about him. He is such an amazing physical therapist and has been such a great CI. Um, but I won't rant too much about him. He'll get annoyed with me. So just a little bit, uh, he went to the best university uh, for undergrad, UMD, go Terps, uh, where he graduated with a bachelor in economics. And he worked for a few years in corporate America before he realized that it wasn't for him. He wanted to get his DPT. So he went to Franklin Pierce University where he got his DPT. He worked at an outpatient ortho clinic before starting at Healthy Baller, which is a cash-based clinic and where he's at currently and has been for the last three years. And since starting at Healthy Baller, he's really just established his name in the world of PT. Um, you might know him from his social media. He's garnered like over 200,000 followers, which is insane. He's created an ACL mastermind group. He's hosted and starred in podcasts and YouTube channels. And most importantly, he's rehabbed some of the best athletes in the nation back to sport. So yeah, Wesley, you ready to get started? <laughs> Yeah, I am. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, do you want to say anything to start off before um, we get to the question? Yeah, we can get right into it. Uh, I guess you said I went where I went to school and everything like that. So, yeah, I think I'm ready to go. Cool. All right. So, the first category we'll talk about is sports PT questions. So, the first question, kind of like the most popular question, was what made you choose sports PT? And then in terms of sports rehab, what makes it so different than like your typical outpatient rehab? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I I went into PT school with the purpose of wanting to work with athletes. Uh, I've torn both my ACLs, unfortunately. And I guess some of you may know this, that I'm rehabbing for my second surgery that was about nine weeks ago. Um, so I went into it with the purpose of always wanting to work with athletes. And, you know, I... I worked at a pretty traditional outpatient physical therapy place owned by orthopedic surgeons. And, um, you know, the whole time I thought I was doing sports PT and I was like, yeah, I, this, this is it. You know, I, I had maybe five athletes on my caseload and I was like that, this is it. And then I started to shadow Teddy. I went, I would go to go to go, I would go to healthy ball to shadow him for a few hours after my full work day. And then after getting to healthy baller, I was like, wow, like this is what it actually looks like to work with athletes. Um, like Teddy was just, you know, every time I, every time I would go in there, it would be like athlete, 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 three, four in a row. Um, and then for me, I would be begging to have athletes. Like I would literally walk up to the front desk ladies and be like, please put athletes on my schedule so I can get them. Um, and then just coming to healthy baller where it's just like a whole different world where pretty much everyone that walks in the door is an athlete or an active adult. Um, so at least for us, as far as like your question about like what is different, um, even facility wise, I feel like that already is a big part of why we're different. We have a 40 yard turf space. Um, we have a, an extensive weight room. Um, like the heaviest dumbbell that my old clinic used to have was 10 pounds. And we also had a 15 pound kettlebell. And that was the heaviest weight that we had in the entire facility. Um, but then you think about at least, you know, for me, specializing in ACL rehab, like what is the goal of ACL rehab? And that's to obviously restore full function of the knee. And that includes strength, which is maybe the biggest one. Um, so I always found like I couldn't do much more beyond maybe three months. And I was always figuring out like, what can I do? That's 
like what else can I do? So I would be the one referring them to Teddy. And that's actually how him and I got connected in the first place. Um, so that's kind of like, I guess, the long winded answer as to kind of the, the big difference. And on top of that, like we, you know, we see every single patient for an hour. Um, the usage of the turf space is like invaluable. Like I walk in every single day and see the turf space and it's something that I do not take for granted because that is something that is absolutely required for the late stages of any, any recovery, lower extremity. Um, but being able to sprint, cut, decelerate, change directions, reactive work, all that kind of stuff that's absolutely necessary um, to like fully prepare the athlete to go back to their sport. Um, and our rehab sessions look like they are like a sports training session because that's what it should look like, especially for the late stages. Like we're preparing them for a very physically demanding activity and the rehab, in my opinion, has to match that level. Otherwise, we're not really doing our job as PTs. Uh, Wesley, also, I'm putting the questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat, just in case like you want to see them um, for reference. But yeah, I think that having that turf space and seeing you work with athletes on that turf space, like I can't imagine rehabbing athletes without that now because of how much you use it and how like valuable it is to you and them. Um, and so the next question was actually what makes a good sports PT? So you kind of touched on like rehab that meets the demand of the sport. Um, can you like elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, I think understanding the physical demands of the sport is super important. Um, I think having constant communication with the athletes is super important. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to understand their sports. You know, I, I've had to work with like a girl who played field hockey and I was like, I don't know what the heck field hockey is, is, is a stick and a ball and the, you know, you're bent over half the time and that's all I really knew about the sport but she was suffering, she had a groin strain. So it's like, I didn't realize exactly how much frontal plane motion that they had in their sport. So asking her questions, like, you know, digging deeper about like, what can I do to help again? You know, I'm, I'm gonna say multiple times where it's like the rehab has to meet the demand. So she was having groin strains every time she shot because there, it's just like a big, like violent sweeping motion for, for field hockey. So like, again, picking their brains a little bit um, is important. And then for, you know, like, I mean, you can tell I see a lot of lacrosse girls. So it's like, what are your run tests? Like, what are the demands? What what type of weights does your strength coach at school expect you to be throwing around? Um, they, those are all the different, and like, what does your weightlifting packet look like for the summer? You know, these are all questions that I never really asked. Um, and on top of that, you need to ask about training volume, you know, outside of PT, if they're, you know, the late stage, like, are you going outside and shooting around for an hour, hour and a half, and then playing some pickup or whatever it is. And then you come in for your second PT session of the week and your knee's a little bit flared up. And it's like, why is it flared up? Um, so I think asking these like more probing questions is a big part of what makes a good sports PT. Um, and on top of that, having a found, like a good solid foundational understanding of strength and conditioning is super, super important. You know, we're not picking up light weights. You know, I have like what, what most people I would consider like, I guess, skinny petite girls that I have, and they're picking up, you know, 80, 90 pounds with doing a single leg exercise, and then they're back squatting 150 pounds. Um, so it's like having an understanding of how to slowly and progressively and safely, obviously load up to a point where they are extremely strong so that their knees can handle everything that they need to be able to handle. Um, so I think those are kind of the two bigger concepts, understanding like the physical demands and the strength and conditioning side is how to match that in order to meet it. Um, and now you can tack on like the reactive work, the movement sessions, the stuff that, you know, we do with, we've learned from some of the strength coaches, our facility. I feel like that, those are kind of the three main components that can really make a good sports PT. Yeah, for sure. Um, question number three was how do you clear an athlete? Um, have you seen shortcomings in return to sport testing concerning athletes who have come to you from other clinics or settings? Um, yeah, so for us returning for, and I'll, I guess I'll mostly talk on the ACL side, but even if you extrapolate that to any other injury, whether it's an upper extremity injury, low back injury, whatever it is, like we need to feel comfortable that we have pushed them to a certain threshold within the facility. Um, so for, for example, again, for, for my ACLs, like after we lift, um, can they handle a certain amount of runs, uh, or, or sprinting or cutting, whatever it is, without having any issues with their knee. After you do that for, you know, a few weeks, then it's like, okay, maybe you're starting to think about like, okay, can they start going back to partial practices, right? Maybe 25 to 50% of practice. And then you're sitting out for 
part of it so that, that that mentally is a little bit easier for them to, to conceptualize where it's like oh no I don't have to go back to a full practice it's only half practice I can tell my coaches to sit out of the more aggressive drills or whatever it is um, so I think that's a big part of it too but as far as the specific for return to sport for ACLs we have a pretty rigorous battery of tests that we do um, which includes actually psychological testing we give them the ACL RSI which is I feel like some a big component of rehab that's not really talked about enough is the mental side um, but we also have our force plates that we that Teddy bought for us that we can use to basically screen out whether or not they have any discrepancies between the two sides. Uh, it measures like rate of force development. It measures jump height. Um, it measures like powers, uh, the amount of power you're able to output in newtons. Um, and on top of that, we also use our Kaiser machine to also gauge the difference between the two sides. Um, we also have a handheld dynamometer that we use to test, and we have an inline dynamometer that we use to test as well. Um, so we use any type of tool that we possibly can. Those are probably the four to five major ones that we use to uh, objectively measure whether or not someone is ready. Um, I think, to be honest, the most ridiculous thing is to clear someone based on like your hands, like using an MMT to gauge like, oh, you're a five out of five. And then you're a five out of five on this side. Cool. You're, you're good to go. It's probably the most ridiculous thing I've seen. And, you know, you talk about the shortcomings and that certainly is one of them. Um, any, any PT facility that is clearing people Again, whether it's ACL, whether it's whatever it is, without any type of objective measuring or any type of like fairly extensive strength training uh, is not doing their job um, very well, in my opinion. Um, especially you think you think about an ACL, like you can ruin a kid's life. You know, I, I, people say it's pretty extreme to say, but that's the reality of it. Uh, we had an 18 year old girl that used to come in to train with us. She tore ACL three times um, before the age of 18 and she retired from playing soccer at the age of 18. Um, when she had aspirations, when she was, you know, 14, 15 years old of playing college level soccer. Um, so these are the type of the things that we think about in order to like really, and again, we don't bat a perfect percentage for ACLs or anything like that. Um, but we do our best to make, to, to have objective tests in order to ensure that they are ready and confident to go back. Yeah, I think one thing that has kind of been like a common theme just from being your student is so many athletes like walk through the door and they either are like, I was at a prior PT place and I wasn't getting the treatment I needed or that I needed to return to sport. Or another crazy thing is like, there's been a lot of athletes that have come in and said, I was cleared, but I couldn't run without pain or I was cleared, but like I was still having all these deficits. And for an athlete to be able to recognize like, how am I cleared at this point is like pretty crazy. And like, I think one thing that one athlete told me was she was cleared because she had met the required amount of weeks of PT, but she couldn't run on her, she couldn't run. She was in so much pain. And then like Wesley tested her and she was nowhere near where she needed to be to return to sport. So I think that's also been just like a theme that I've heard as a student and just like interacting with these athletes. Um, moving on to the next question. So how do you handle treating athletes who are at the college and professional level who might be seeing another PT or AT when they're back at school or have like a team that's out of state? Um, good question. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it definitely takes some communication. Um, it's very challenging when um, I may not agree with what they're doing, uh, which does happen more often than not, unfortunately. Um, you know, again, I see a lot of ACLs, so it's like my thing. I have a structural way of doing things that I think that needs to be done in order to hit every single detail, check every single box so that they are safe to go back. And a lot of times, you know, I can communicate with the ATs um, just because I'm talking more so for like my collegiate level athletes. Um, I can communicate them with all I want, but a lot of times once they go back to school, they're, they're out of my hands. Um, I do try to make it known to all my college level athletes that like you can, you can, you know, if you're, if you're, something doesn't make any sense and it's like very off from what I'm doing, like we can set up a FaceTime um, to, to, to talk about it and see if we can work around it or see if we can work with your trainers to figure out a way to communicate it so that we can get you better level of care. Um, you know, in, in the college level setting, it's tough. You know, Gabby's talked about her, her experience working or rehabbing as a college level athlete too, where it's like they're the the ATs the PTs and college those things are expected to see like ridiculously high volumes just because you know they they don't know when a kid's gonna walk in or maybe it's four or five kids in an hour that are coming in and it's hard for them to manage all that so it's like I try not to fault them um, but again I've talked about the levels of 
of ACR rehab where like, again, you can screw up a kid, you know, it's, 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 it's scary. Um, I had two girls who go to Notre Dame right now and there was four of them, four girls on their team that were all recovering from about the same stage, like really late stage. They had their full, first full practice and one of their teammates tore the other side. Um, and then we, uh, I talked to my girls about it and they're like, yeah, like her PT didn't really push her and challenge her and the school just threw her back in there. And the sad reality is that this is really common. You know, it's like, if there's no communication, it's hard for them to gauge. So like for me, I take videos, I send them to the ATs. I, I let them know like, this is what we've been doing. And whether or not they choose to listen is kind of on them because a lot of times they don't. And I've had other athletes, I won't say the school specifically, but she was basically rehabbing on her own. She said that she could go a full week without seeing the AT or the PT. Uh, she would walk in the training room, grab her piece of paper, check, 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 walk out the door. Um, and then when she sent me a program, I was like floored because it was an awful program. So I basically rewrote her entire program and she actually ended up doing my program while she was at school, but she just checked off that she did the school's program. Um, so we've had to do these like behind the back things, I guess. But for me, at the end of the day, I just care about getting my kids better. Um, I don't care how they get it. Um, so if we had to do something that's like a little more undercover, I guess, whatever you want to say, because the, the, the AT won't communicate, I'm willing to do that because I just want my athletes to get better. Um, so it, it's tough, but I, I, I definitely have had some schools who communicate really, really well, but I would say, unfortunately, for the most part, um, a lot of schools in my experience, the ATs aren't doing a good enough job because some of it is due to maybe lack of education on the ATs part. Um, cause a lot of my kids will see. An AT who's like, oh, it's a fresh AT who just came in, and it's like, oh, they're my, you're my first ACL. It's like, yeah, I don't want to be your first ACL. Um, so it's 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 definitely tricky, but it's it's something that I I still consistently try to do, just consistently try to stay stay in constant communication with the the PTs or the ATs. All right. Um, the next question is, what was your experience with PT school, and does GPA matter? Um, <laughs> my experience with PT school, uh, I was, uh, at the bottom of my class, uh, and then a lot of people are like, I'm like, no, you're not. But I was like, yes, I literally was at the bottom of my class because that was the only one on probation. So that by definition would make me at the bottom of my class. Um, I, I, I share that because I think that, uh, PT school is very hard for me. Uh, very, very hard. Um, I came in with a business background, you know, I was a few years out of school, um, a little bit older than someone like the like the, the, my classmates who came uh, directly out from undergrad, you know, they were 22, 23, I was like 26, 27. Um, so a little bit older, I had some work experience in the business field as well. Um, so yeah, transitioning to school is very, very hard as you know, you can tell from me being on probation. Um, so the entire first year was me just learning like what was the best way for me to study. I found myself consistently trying to like adapt to the way my classmates would study. You know, some of them love studying in groups and some of them love studying by themselves. So I just kept like experimenting back and forth. And then obviously a lot of you guys know it already where it's like the volume in PD school is so high, especially the first year. And it's like your brain is just mushed the entire time. Um, and for whatever reason, my school's passing score for everything was considered was an 83. Um, so like, for example, I got like a 78 or 79 class. So that put me on probation. And then the second class that like, continued me on to probation. I got an 81.75, um, which for the most part is considered a pretty, I mean, for me, I'm cool with getting a, a B minus, but that wasn't good enough for the school. And they've since actually lowered the 83 down to an 80. So that actually would have saved me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so PD school for me was really hard. Um, but you know, it's one of those things you just kind of truck through. Um, and then by my second year, I was much more settled in. Um, I had a much better flow of how to study. Um, I found my way of studying and not something that I was adapting to somebody else. And second year was, I, I kind of coasted through and, and did significantly better compared to my first year. Um, GPA for PT school, in my opinion, does not matter, just pass. <laughs> um, at no point, I mean, I, I've had three PT jobs at this point and no one really cared about my GPA. Um, they, no one really cared that I was at the bottom of my class because I, I, I personally, I don't think that the academic side is a direct reflection of who you are going to be as a physical therapist. Um, you know, I've been, I'm fortunate enough to be able to work in this environment and some of my classmates like, are like, they want to work in this type of environment. But like, I guess for me, the entrepreneurial side was able to kick in a little bit and help me to be able to build what we are, 
build where we are now. Um, you know, I've been a healthy baller for about three and a half years now, and I've been able to like help, help Teddy grow this thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's been fun. It's been a tough journey, like a lot of ups and downs, uh, especially like my first year and a half was just like a major grind of working a ton of hours trying to build up to be able to be like sustainable, I guess. Um, so yeah, personally, for my, my opinion, I don't think GPA matters that much as long as you pass and get your license. All right, next question. Can you comment on how well PT school prepared you to work in a sports PT setting or if you feel a significant amount of knowledge has come from other sources? So like research, mentorship from other PTs, mentorship from strength coaches, personal experience with injury, et cetera. That was a long one, so it's in the chat if you need <laughs> that. Um, my personal opinion for, and again, this is speaking from my school, the answer is no um, at all. Uh, we had a guest lecture that would come in to do a, like a, it was an elective course, but the majority of the class ended up taking it about sports PT. Um, and, you know, again, knowing what I know now at the time when I was in it, I was like, wow, this is really cool. But like, I mean, no, no offense to the person that taught it, but she was like much older, you know, like in her fifties and sixties. And like, it's just, and the stuff that she was teaching us is like, I guess a little bit outdated and things like that. And, you know, for us, like we, I've learned pretty much everything that I know about sports, 80% about what I know about sports PT from the people at Healthy Baller. And that includes Teddy, our strength coaches, um, that I'm able to just like pick their brains. And my first year at Healthy Baller, I was, I was slow, you know, being in cash base, like you have to slowly build up your caseload. Um, so for me, I took time, like I would, I would block off time in my schedule to be like, Hey, Hey Matt, can you teach me this? Hey Wes, can you teach me this? And then we have some coaches who are more like this, like sports oriented where they could teach about lacrosse or basketball, whatever it is. And then other strength coaches who are much more like purely strength. So it's like, okay, can you teach me about, um, how to program? Can you teach me about how to, you know, change tempos and things like that and teach me different exercises. So I spent as much time during my first year to year and a half, like picking their brains. And for me, just putting it all together, Teddy would offer mentorship sessions every single week. Um, and which we do right now with our new, uh, we have, we hired a girl five months ago, um, Christine, and then another girl that we hired a year to year and a half ago, who no longer works with us, Alyssa, we would block off time to mentor them. Cause I think that's a big part of PT that's not really there. Unfortunately, like my first two jobs, I had no mentorship at all. It was just, here's your 55 to 60 patients a week and go to work. Um, so yeah, my personal experience is that I, my PT school didn't really prepare me very well. A lot of it came from like personal mentorship and also obviously a good amount does come from reading research articles. Um, Instagram nowadays is a pretty big resource for, for, for people. Um, so yeah, those are probably for, for me where I've learned most of my stuff. Yeah. I wanted to add like, just like the past few weeks, like, Teddy, Sweezy, and Wesley and I will like read an article that like someone picks um, just about like current evidence. And I think that in school, when we're given like research, we're kind of all like, ooh, another long article to read, like what level of evidence, like, but I've really seen the benefit of like being able to read an article, talk about it with people who already know so much and just learn from it and learn from like what is going on in like current evidence-based practice with that. Moving on, so the next question is, what is your advice for new grads? Do you have any tips for navigating the first couple of months post-grad? Uh, yeah, this, it's always a good question. Um, and I think back to what I did um, as a new grad and what I should have done. Uh, so I took the first job, I took a job with my last clinical. That was the first job that I took. I didn't really do, I, I did zero digging. It was just, I was like, are you guys looking to hire? They said, yes. So I took the job. <laughs> that was pretty much it. Um, personally, I wish I did a significantly better job of, of asking questions to not just them, but also to um, other potential employers. Uh, you know, I talked about mentorship. I feel like that's absolutely massive. I think that you can learn a lot of bad habits because you're so, you know, as a new grad, you're kind of like, you, you want to come in, you want to make a good impression and you're pretty, you're, you're still like, you're still soaking in stuff, you know, like it's your first time like working in what you think is going to be your niche. You know, for me, it was outpatient. So I went outpatient and I was just trying to soak in things and I ended up soaking in things, which in my opinion were not the best. Um, you know, I had some old coworkers sometimes that would literally just take a lacrosse ball and rub it on whatever body part hurt. And, and sometimes this person would take a foam roller and like, if it, if someone had like it band pain, they would just like take the foam roller and just rub it on this person's on the side of their leg. 
And then it's just like, I never did that, but I was like, what is that really doing? You know? And then all of a sudden I come to healthy baller and, you know, Teddy like just sat down and talked to me, explained to me, explained things to me. And it just really, I, I learned, I told Teddy this, I've learned more, I learned more from him in like three to six months of him sitting down and mentoring me than I did in two and a half years of working in other facilities. Um, and unfortunately we hear a lot where they, you go into a more volume type of facility. You know, for me, I was expected to see about 55 to 60 a week. Like there's no time for any type of mentorship, you know, where it's just, you, you see your six, seven patients, you wolf down your lunch and you see your other six, seven patients, then you go home. Um, so I, I think that a place that can offer some sort of mentorship, in my opinion, is probably the number one thing. Um, and obviously for, for new grads, I can, you guys are in a much better situation because your tuition is lower than the majority, everybody out there. Um, but that is obviously something to pay attention to as well, because it's a reality that PT schools are really expensive. Um, and paying off your loans is, is, a, is a daunting task in itself. So, you know, I think learning the financial side of life is super important too, because you don't want to be paying off loans when you're 55 years old, ideally. Um, so yeah, those are probably some of the bigger devices, finding a mentorship and figuring out like how to manage your finances as well. All right, next question. How did you find your niche within the profession? At what point did you decide to specialize in ACLs? And do you suggest that someone who wants to be involved in sports PT choose a specialty? Um, so I found my I found my niche because I have torn both my ACLs, like I said. Um, but even when I got to healthy ball, like that was not, never really a thought. It was just, I wanted to work with athletes. I wanted to, you know, that, that was always my thing. And being on the entrepreneur side and like, you know, navigating through that, it, it is kind of nice to be known for something. And that doesn't mean that's all I really treat. You know, I, I, I treat low backs, I treat muscle strains, I treat ankle sprains, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's not like, it's not like I only treat ACLs. Um, but it, at the end of the day, it's like, if I'm known for something that's better than known for nothing. Um, and for me, it's, it's, if somebody gets, if a friend, if a friend has another friend that tears their ACL, it's like, Oh wow, I work with Wesley and he's great. He specializes in ACL rehab. Boom. Then, then they're coming to see me. Um, so I chose to specialize in ACLs probably six months or so into, uh, working at, at, at healthy baller. Um, I had a, I had a young athlete, um, I, she was a senior in high school recovering from an ACL and, you know, at the time I was still kind of learning about ACL rehab and, and, you know, I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to specialize in. Um, and then I spent so much time with her because I had a lot of time on my hands. I my, my schedule was pretty open. So like her hour sessions ended up being an hour and a half and now I'm 45 and some of it was due to, you know, honestly, some inefficiencies in my programming. Um, and we would just do a lot of like a lot of strength training, a lot of movement stuff, a lot of soccer stuff, just to try to build her confidence. And I think I really, really enjoyed the relational aspect of it um, because like her and I still talk today, you know, we, we check in on each other. She stopped in to see me before she went back to school in the fall um, just to stop in and say hi. And it's like a really special bond that you can end up for forming with these people, with these young people. Um, so it's, that's kind of why now at this point really pushed forward with, with ACLs. Um, and do I suggest someone be, uh, do I suggest that someone specializes in something in sports PT I think it more so matters if you are in maybe more of a cash based setting. Um, again, it is important to be known for something. I do not think it's a requirement, to be honest. I think you can run a perfectly good sports PT cash based facility and not specialize in anything. Um, but at least for me, it was probably the best decision that I could have made in my career. Again, being able to, to specialize in it. Um, also, because, you know, from a cash PT side, like if someone wants to come to me from day one post op, I have them for, you know, eight, nine months coming to see me two, three times a week. So from a business standpoint, that obviously is a big plus as well. Um, and even with like my, my social media and the mastermind group I've, I've been able to create, it was, you know, probably the best decision I could have made for my career is choosing to specialize in ACL rehab. All right, last question for the sports PT category. So are there any certifications that are necessary or beneficial when working with an athlete population? Do you believe that sports residencies are beneficial? Uh, I definitely get this question a lot. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's really, really hard for me to answer that because I don't have a certification or um, I didn't go to residency. Uh, neither, neither did Teddy, neither did Sweezy, neither did Alyssa. <laughs> so all the PTs that we've had at, at our facility have not gone to any type of residency. 
Um, I definitely do not think it's a mandatory thing. Um, I think that if you can, if you want to be a business owner, in my opinion, I think you're better spent, your time will be better spent um, developing your business skills and networking with local strength coaches and building that relationship in that year to two years, however long residency is, as opposed to going to residency and then doing that. You know, I think a lot of people and myself included when I was in PT school, you want like I used to want the alphabet after my name. I was like, I, I would I literally Google like what type of certs and things like that I can get after my name so that I could, I don't know, have my have my name look cooler, whatever you want to say. But to this day, I still have the same five letters after my name It's just PTDBT. That's all I have. And I don't plan on getting anything more. You know, I don't plan on going OCS, SCS, any of that type of stuff, at least not in the immediate future. Um, again, I'm not a very big school person. Um, as in like, you know, tests and things like that. But I do learn consistently, especially about my niche, which is ACO rehab. Um, and at the same time, still developing my like business skills as well, staying like listening to podcasts, reading books, reading blog posts and things like that is still super important too. Um, so it kind of just depends on what you're looking for. Um, I, I'm very happy with where I'm at right now. I have no plans to change in the near future or even the long-term future. I think this is exactly where I'm meant to be. Um, so, you know, from speaking from my perspective and at least my coworkers, uh, we have not had, you know, any type of residency or anything like that. All right. So that was the end of the sports PT category. Um, before we move on to cash base and then eventually social media and marketing, does anybody have any questions that they want Wesley to kind of touch on more regarding sports PT, how he rehabs his athletes? really anything um you know jospt is obviously pr a pretty popular one um and the journal of sports medicine rehab um pretty popular ones and even then like a lot of people i do follow a good amount of people on like social media who <laughs> honestly help me stay up to date um they will post a lot more research articles like um you know particularly for acr rehab mick hughes is pretty big um uh, kevin wilk uh lenny macrina um those are a few of the the bigger names that consistently like will put research out there on their social media. So whenever they post it, I'll usually will I just screenshot it and then I'll look it up when I go home. Um, maybe not the most efficient way, but it's it's I, I found it pretty good because you know they're they're just as passionate about AC rehab as I am. So it's obviously nice to stay in kind of the same world and and you know pick their brains. Um, for objective testing. Um, I usually, and some of it is depending on like, I, I, Gabby knows this by now, but like, I hate giving timelines, um, because it literally is impossible to tell. Like we have a girl who's, who played uh, division one basketball had horrendous, what I consider horrendous level of care. Um, she was seven months post-op when she came to see me and she could barely jog, uh, without any pain. Actually, sorry, she couldn't jog without any pain. Um, so it's hard for me to be like, you know, X amount of time. To, to, to do that testing. I personally don't do a lot of objective testing until they're pretty, you know, f further along because I think that I should be gaining enough information, whether it's through lifting, movement assessments, doing the jumping and landings, things like that, excuse me, that can give me enough information to figure out how to program for them. Obviously later on when they're in that like mid to late stage of, of rehab, like that's when you should be starting to consider testing to figure out where those final holes are um, but you know, as far as like consistency goes, it's not something I'm doing in the earlier mid phase, even for like the ACL RSI, which is much more psychological. I had a student ask me like, like, should I give this to a patient who's two months post-op? I'm like, no, you know, like the, the ACL RSI is meant to, to figure out like psychologically, are you there to go back, um, and ask you questions like, are you scared to do, you know, your sport? Um, but it's like at two months, of course you are. Um, so there's definitely a time and place to be giving that. And some of it, I guess, comes from experience as to when you feel like you're ready, uh, when you feel like they're ready. Um, but I think that unless there's some, like, in, maybe insurance purposes, that might be another reason why you might might be doing those type of things earlier than than expected. Um, but I think that if you if you and your in your head know that they are definitely not ready, then you should be able to prove it to them, whether it's in the weight room, like, hey, like they're able to, you know, split squat. 80 pounds on one leg and 40 pounds on the other, whatever it is, any type, like, like those type of things, that should be your consistent objective measure that you're giving them, um, as opposed to having to give specific tests and measures like that. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, I was also going to add 
um, especially with like your late later stage athletes, like you rehab them so well that they're pretty strong by the end, especially if they're about to return to sport. So like I saw Wesley when um, our Kaiser cable machine broke, he was using the handheld dyna dynamometer on an athlete and he's like fighting her because these, these girls and guys are really strong. So I feel like your unconventional objective measures, like you said, the force plate, the cable, the quad kicks, the hop, everything like that, it's needed for this level because they are strong at the end and a manual muscle test, even a handheld like dynamometer isn't always like sufficient. <laughs> Um, differences between how I rehab and, um, other PTs, um, this could probably go on for four hours, but I'll try and keep it short. Um, I think that a lot of places that are more like generalists for PTs, uh, and I'm talking like where, I, like places where I used to work, um, it's, it comes down to the fact that a lot of PTs who don't have extensive experience treating ACLs, they'll end up just following the protocol that the surgeon gives them. Um, I haven't looked at a protocol in over two years at this point, you know, for my post-ops, all like the, the, what I care about the most is their, if they had a meniscus repair and obviously what graft choice, um, because if they had a meniscus repair and the, the doctor says that they want, you know, six weeks of non-weight bearing, then I'm going to obviously be respectful of that because that's a surgery itself. Um, but I don't need a surgeon telling me how to do rehab, um, because I have enough experience at this point where I'm confident in progressive loading, you know? every patient is individualized as far as ACL rehab goes. But a lot of these protocols say that from zero to two weeks, you should be here, two to six weeks, you should be here. And I find myself, even in my rehab, I'm nine and a half weeks out now. I have a girl who's five days after me and another girl who's two weeks after me. The girl who's two weeks after me is doing better than I am. I also had a meniscus repair. Um, I'm also twice her age. <laughs> There's a lot of variables that comes into play about like ACL rehab. So that's definitely one of them. Um, I think that a lot of places, again, because they follow these protocols, that the the basketball girl is a perfect example. That place was just following these protocols. So they're like, oh, at, four, at three and a half months, you should be jogging. So go jog. Um, I have another girl right now who's over a year out and she's having a lot of complications because, again, in my opinion, that place just didn't like they just told her to run. They actually never looked at her running. They gave her, you know, the there's like a running template that's like run the straightaway. You start by running the straightaways and you walk the turns and you kind of build up from there. And she was doing that and she just kept running with pain and they never really talked about that. Um, so those are some of the details that I feel like are really missed out. On top of that, I think that in the mid to later stages, a lot of PT places don't really understand exactly how much loading needs to go on in order to get these people like back to full, full strength. And we're lifting like, we're, lift, we're throwing around a ton of weight, um, I, again, up to their physical capabilities, but I do wanna push that to the best of my ability. Um, so doing a lot of single leg exercises, because that's super important too, to be able to either obviously bias to one side and also to figure out if there's differences between the two. So strength training is another big one. Uh, learning how to neuromuscular control. Like I do some type of neuromuscular control for my, for my patients every single session. Because again, research supports that having better neuromuscular control gives you a better chance of, of succeeding. Um, even as a injury reduction side of things is super, super important as well. And then lastly, you're talking about like the movement session of it, right? For us, we have the 40 yard turf space. So we're doing a lot of reactive work, full speed sprint work, full speed cutting uh, with contact. You know, a lot of my lacrosse goes that come in, I, I will like, I'll take a ball as, as, and like, I'll feed it to them. And then I'll, I'll, I'll have the ball next to them and just hitting them, hitting them over and over again, because that's what happens to them in a game. Um, and then we have already talked at length about the objective testing that needs to happen too. Um, so that's kind of like the whole, you know, again, all under this one umbrella about the differences between what we're doing and maybe a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of other PT facilities and schools aren't doing. Because again, you look at statistics, retear rates now are 20 to 25%. So one every four to five kids are suffering a retear, especially you're talking about adolescent females under 18. They're the highest demographic of suffering a retear. You know, thankfully, again, like knock, knock on wood, but Teddy and I have actually only had two retears in the four, like, total four and a half years that, that we've been in business. Um, so, but I think a lot of it comes down to us being able to make sure we hit all these details like quads, hamstrings, glutes, calves, everything, making sure that we're getting it all the way back and not just, you know, good enough, which I feel like is often said is, is good enough is, is fine. Um, but that's not the case when it comes to ACR rehab, every single detail makes a big difference. 
Thank you for watching today's video. Please feel free to like and subscribe and share it on your social media platforms. If you're interested, I have started an ACO Mastermind Group, which is a growing library of content centered around ACO rehab. It has exercises ranging from immediate post-op to late stage sports specific movements and everything in between. It's a growing library and currently holds over 250 videos. There's content centered around assessments, movement breakdowns, exercise breakdowns, case studies, and a whole lot more. You also gain access to a private forum where you can engage with like-minded people, ask questions, share research articles, and share resources. If you're interested, please feel free to click the link below. Thank you for watching.